your research was kind of inconclusive, but then it turned out that it was inconclusive for a reason. You know, the people who, who really are successful are those who embrace results that make no sense and pursue them rather than throw them out. And I didn't have the courage to do that. My career is what got broken. It, it's just another story of sort of how I got out of pathology. My, I, so my research career was done. Uh, although I was board certified, I really had no clinical skills left and you know I really needed to go back and just be a practicing pathologist and the um, person who sort of told me I was no, no longer have a job at Duke said but we're going to give you you know a year's salary and you can do whatever you want and I said maybe I just need to go back and be a, a resident again and I think I've done something that no one in the history of the world has done I went from being an assistant professor to being a first year resident in the same department Welcome, Digital Pathology Trailblazers. Today, my guest is Dr. Richard Levinson. And let me start with the story how I met, and met in the quotation marks, because uh, we actually never met in person. But I got introduced to Richard with his work. I didn't know it was his work. I mean, I heard the author of the paper, but it was still during my residency uh, at the veterinary conference in Fulda, Germany, where it was the first time when the his paper about training pigeons was introduced. And the title of this paper is Pigeons as Trainable Observers of Pathology in Radiology Breast Cancer Images. And this was presented as like kind of a funny thing, funny research. And I didn't know it was Richard's paper, but I believe any pathologist will recognize the picture from this paper, a pigeon sitting inside a box with some grain uh, disposing device that gives uh, the pigeon a reward for a, collect, a correct classification of the malignancy of the tumor. So that was the first thing. And the second thing was uh, quite recently, and then we were already connected on LinkedIn, and we kind of started conversation was an air paper called AI and Pathology, What Could Possibly Go Wrong? Where uh, there is a list of what could possibly go wrong. And that's what we're going to be talking about. So Richard, welcome very much to the podcast. How are you today? Thank you so much. I'm reasonably well. It's sunny and gorgeous here in Davis, California. For those of you who don't know, and that was probably 98% of you, is, is just 12 miles away from Sacramento, where the UC Davis Medical Center is. Fantastic. I didn't know it. I mean, I knew you were in California, you see, this, but I didn't know exactly why. So, Richard, let's start with you. Let's. Okay. Um, I would love you to introduce yourself to the listeners and talk about yourself, talk about your research, talk about the focus of your research, and then we're going to dive in into the episode. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here, or in Davis. <laughs> um, and um, my my particular story is very, very unusual. Um, and in fact, I was asked to give a, a, a talk on it uh, or talk about me to, uh, I think it was uh, at Dartmouth. And the title of my talk was My Path In and Out of Path, because I've literally been in and out of pathology over my many years. And um, I actually started as an undergraduate studying early modern English, French, and German history and literature. Okay. Yes. Interesting. That explains parts of one of the papers. Like entirely possible. And uh, the title that I should have uh, uh, had for my thesis, but I didn't have the courage back there, back then, was uh, it was about the French Restoration. And the title should have been Charles X, Bourbon on the Rocks. But uh, I didn't, I didn't dare there, to do it. <laughs> with deep regrets. So managed to uh, extract myself from history and literature and went to medical school. And then... Um, did you actually you know, like practice the literature? Did you Well, I actually did a, a, a post-MA, a BA uh, time at University of Cambridge or Cambridge University. To this day, I don't know whether it's University of Cambridge or Cambridge University, but one of the two. And I was doing uh, more uh, history and literature there. Uh, interestingly enough, with the same tutor that my mother had had when she was at Cambridge. What? Yes, okay. bizarre. Uh, but fortunately for me, uh, I had spent the summer before that in a wonderful thing, Judah Folkman's laboratory. Judah Folkman, mm -hmm. for many of you will recognize as the sort of founder of, of modern angiogenesis research. In other words, how tumors, largely how tumors get their blood. How as a literature researcher did you spend the summer in an angiogenesis lab? I have one word for you. Nepotism. Okay. My, my, See, literally, connections nepotism. is everything. My uh, nepotism literally means uh, sort of doing your nephew a favor. And it turns out that my uncle 
had been a neighbor of Judah Folkman's. And so this was literal classic nepotism. And I had, I had to be fair, I had done enough of uh, uh, sort of pre-med courses uh, to qualify to go to medical school. So I wasn't completely naive. I knew what mm -hmm. organic chemistry was, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and so I got put into Judah Folkman's lab that summer. And it was such a fantastic experience that history sort of paled in comparison. I lasted one term at Cambridge and only managed to learn and then forget how to do the uh, London Times crossword puzzle. Then I came home <laughs> and rejoined the lab uh, and then went to medical school the next year, University of Michigan. Yeah. Interesting. There, the, the other sort of fortunate thing was that uh, in my years, all smart kids went into internal medicine. That was sort of the track, you know. The, uh, the not so smart ones went into orthopedic surgery. <laughs> <laughs> and the smart ones all went into, into internal medicine. So I was tracking myself there, but with no, you know, no, no real internal sense of destination. Uh, and fortunately, one of my friends said, have you considered pathology? And I hadn't, in fact, to, to the extent that I had actually failed the final in pathology. I passed the course because of quizzes, but I failed. 69 is failing here. I got a 69 on the final. And, uh, but he said, you should go into pathology because, and he knew I was interested in research, because it means that, that you can, uh, hey, study anything you want. If you go into Durham, you have to do skin for the rest of your life. In pathology, you can study anything. And secondly, if you go to a, a good academic center, you can be on the autopsy service, which is like only a 20% commitment. And the rest of the time you can have for, um, for yourself. For and then um, also... You don't have nights and weekends if you're on the autopsy service because they just put the body in the chiller over the weekend. And this yes, sounded great sir. to me. And that's exactly what I did. Um, I went to, you know, I went after Michigan Medical School. I went to Duke University for to be on faculty. All along the way, I, I also managed to help uh, one of my friends who was also one of these smart kids uh, who were going into uh, internal, internal medicine, medicine. And she, but because she was smart. But she was so under committed to that that she was in horrible despair and was crying every night. And I said to her, have you considered pathology? And she had not. And she looked into it and she loved it. And she became a, a um, career. But why, why is that? Like, but actually, I have a similar experience. Like, I didn't even know uh, when I was studying in Poland, uh, studying veterinary medicine, I didn't mm -hmm. even know that pathology was that as a veterinarian, you could be a full time pathologist. Yeah. I like. I liked it. I was uh, lucky enough to have a board certified pathologist teach me pathology because I did it in Spain during my exchange year. And we had like a private class for those exchange students because we were like, they were transitioning the curriculum and they didn't really know where to put us. So we had like nine people pathology class with a board certified pathologist. And I'm like, wow, this is so cool. But after I went back to Poland to finish vet school, I had no idea I could do this full time because in Poland, you at that time, you had four veterinary schools and the only veterinary pathologists were working in those schools. So maybe you could like 20 veterinary pathologists. And we didn't, we still don't have any accredited residency centers. Mm. So yeah, yeah, people don't know how cool pathology no. is and like how life compatible it is. Yeah, exactly. And uh, let me just finish the story about my friend and then I'll, I'll, I'll give a little bit about the, the state of pathology training for medical students. So anyway, my friend switched out of uh, uh, internal medicine destination to pathology and she later that year told, or, or later, uh, a few years later, she told me that I had saved her life. So she was the only only person I whose life I saved in medical school. <laughs> I was once a fellow student. As a pathologist. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? The the physician burnout is a real real thing. So yeah, it's a yeah. real life saving and you know something. Uh, I'm of a certain era. We had a whole pathology course um, as medical students, like a whole semester, uh, every every several times a week and uh pathology lab and everything and nowadays are you telling me that it's not the case not the case anymore i thought you get histology but pathology just shows up as sort of an afterthought for case presentations what? you get a presentation of you know heart attack i'm sorry i'm like in shock and hyperventilating yeah, very, in american very... med schools you don't have a pathology course well i don't know and i can't generalize but it certainly changed dramatically um Wow. And the pathologists show up as sort of part of team teaching where you get the clinician and then you get the surgeon and then you get the pathologist who says, oh, it's really X. And they just show up as sort of the answer giver rather than, oh my goodness. You, know, you know, very sad. And this the is number sad. of students pathology is dropping. I hope like I get a bunch of comments. This is not the case in the U.S. No, and in our I, school. We have pathology as a course. I hope I get this. Please do. Uh, this is just my impression. Um, 
but I think it's it's sort of generic. There's so much demand for time, you know, teaching time. So many so many things the school has to get through. The pathology has taken a. Uh, but that explains why people just don't know what no, pathology they is know. if they don't have a course. That's right. Okay. So that's why we need AI in pathology because there aren't mm -hmm. any pathologists. <laughs> Maybe then it's going to be also cooler because it's going to be AI powered and then more people would be interested in it. But why path in and out of pathology? Actually, I was at Duke for nine years, assistant professor. I had my own lab and I started to get into technology uh, uh, back in the day. Confocal microscopy was a, a wild and crazy thing and started to do confocal microscopy for pathology. And my other lab was doing, trying to understand the function of plasminogen activator inhibitor type one in cancer. And it was a, I kept getting very conflicting results, uh, so much so that I never, my research just never gelled. And sometimes I would find it in the cytoplasm and sometimes I would find it in the nucleus. And I thought this was just artifacts and essentially my research cratered. And so mm -hmm. my career at Duke cratered and uh, come to find out sort of 10 years, 15 years later, that PI1 is a really complicated and interesting molecule. And the, my results were actually accurate and it can be intranuclear as well as cytoplasmic. And uh, I just didn't have the courage to go after these anomalies as if they were true and just, uh, or potentially true and not just artifact. Your research was kind of inconclusive, but then it turned out that it was inconclusive for a reason. Yeah. I mean, that's just sort of a moral, um, which I think has been, you know, the people who, who really are successful are those who embrace results that make no sense and pursue them rather than throw them out. And they're the ones who break the paradigms. Right. And I didn't have the courage to do that. So in fact, my career is what got broken. And uh, it, it's just another story of sort of how I got out of pathology. My, I, so my research career was done. Uh, although I was board certified, I really had no clinical skills left. And mm -hmm. it occurred to me that, you know, I really needed to go back and just be a practicing pathologist. And the um, person who sort of told me I was no, no longer have a job at Duke said, but we're going to give you, you know, a year's salary and you can do whatever you want. And I said, maybe I just need to go back and be a, a resident again. And I think I've done something that no one in the history of the world has done. I went from being a assistant professor to being a first year resident in the same department. That is definitely non-standard career non -standard step. Exactly. Oh my goodness. And I lasted about six months there, not because it was so terrible, but a friend of mine said, oh, you should really look at this. And she showed me an article in, I mean, an advertisement in science from applied spectral imaging, uh, which showed the use of, of spectral imaging to uh, understand um, histology examples. So in other words, you, instead of just looking at sort of color images of, of red, you know, red, green, and blue of HA, mm -hmm. you, if you use a, a device which they had developed, which was a, a, a spectroscopic camera, uh, you could get a color spectra from, from the HA &E stain slides and actually distinguish things that you can't distinguish by eye. And I thought that was really cool. And I had had this sort of confocal microscopy experience and I called up the company and said, hey, you want, you want a pathologist to help? And after some hemming and hawing, they said, sure. And I actually got a job with the company, but at Carnegie Mellon University. Okay. Which is oh my goodness. strange. And uh, which is, doesn't have a medical school, uh, but was right next door to the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, I started developing uh, applied spectral imaging tools for multispectral imaging and pathology. And that went well for, for about three years. And then, then things changed as they do. And then I took a job. In industry, in full-time, full-bore industry, Cambridge Research and Instrumentation to develop a different kind, different technology for multispectral imaging, which uh, has turned out to have real legs uh, because as your audience knows about uh, uh, omics, path-omics mm -hmm. or multi-omic multi stuff, one of the mm -hmm. technologies that's used for that is to do fluorescent imaging and use a spectroscopic tools to actually distinguish more than four or five or six different probes. So uh, the company that I worked for, eventually their technology ended up with another company called Akoya Biosciences. Which is very familiar to my That's right. So listeners. it's still, I mean, that's really, I'm, I'm happy because most people who develop, you know, work on technologies from 15, 20 years ago don't usually see it come to fruition, but the same thing is still cooking and is out in the market and, and making real science. I'm fortunate to have that uh, sort of part of the background. Um, so I actually worked for a company. So this is my path out of path, like 10 years. I became vice 
president for research, if I recall correctly, uh, in this technology company, which again is unusual for a history and literature major. Um, indeed. Indeed. And uh, that ended, sadly. All my, my, my sort of interesting joints uh, or, you know, adventures <clears throat> have a, a non-classic ending. And one day I was uh, asked to leave because of various reasons. And as I, but here's the thing, as I was driving Did home- Did you do something? No, it was, I actually, I, I was looking for another, potentially another job and mistakenly pressed the reply all on my email. <laughs> okay. You know, stuff happens. I, I already love this episode. We're, we're like still <laughs> in the introduction part. I love it. I love you it. Know, I'm that, you know, there's a lot more than classic, uh, you know, career paths out there. This but so here's cool. the point. I was driving home from being, you know, asked to leave. And uh, my car was headed direct into not just one, but a double rainbow. So that was a sign from the heavens that there was. A... It was that you're supposed to leave. leave. Exactly. And then I did something that you don't know because it was sort of sudden. I did what everyone who's suddenly uh, deprived of a regular job. I became a consultant. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And I was really that lucky. develop. That was well, that went actually very very well. Um, my my income actually didn't go down, and uh, my first major job was this is where I get into digital path with Omnix, if you recall, which mm -hmm. is the joint venture of GE and the University of Pittsburgh, if I remember correctly. Did get some approval at some point, well, like a clearance for something. something? Cratered uh, uh -huh. as a company, but I think their IP sort of lived on and may have been absorbed by somebody else. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I was working for a year and a half uh, there as a consultant on the sort of the first, you know, serious digital pathology company. Which year was that? Oh, a while ago. Probably 90s or 19. Um, I can't even tell you. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, oh, I'm, um, I have this digital pathology timeline, which is yep. like pre to, uh, 2000, pre mm -hmm. whole slide scanner and post whole slide scanner. Yeah. And then they're like sub, uh, sub parts of this timeline, like pre FDA clearance of the Philips and mm -hmm. both. Actually, when I was with Applied Spectral Imaging, I worked with Dirk Sankson, who was the founder of Aperio. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So these are all these chance encounters with, you know, major, major players, which, which has been very, very interesting. So um, about 2009 is when I, when I left CRI and probably around then is when I started working for uh, um, Omnix. Mm -hmm. um, and then that my, my consulting gig lasted for three years. And here's the last thing that never, ever happens. I'm just sitting at home working from one of, my, one of our bedrooms in Brighton, Massachusetts. And I got a phone call and the person on the other end of the call said, hi, Richard. She's from uh, uh, Romania, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Hi, Richard. Um, would you like to be a professor at UC Davis? And I a said- A person from Romania calling- No, 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 I mean, she's a faculty member at- uh, Okay. <laughs> yeah, not, no, no, that would be very, very strange. But I was just trying to, I was putting on a slate accent. Uh, okay. mm -hmm. It's from mm -hmm. European accent. No known uh, specificity. So, so like out of out, so out she out took you room. out of consultancy with a phone call to become a professor at UC Davis. Right, full professor okay. with tenure. Like without well, like out of, no. out of I didn't apply. They just said, "Hey, you want to be a professor?" And I said, "Sure." You know what? Everything can happen. <laughs> so I've been here. I've been here at UC Davis for um, coming on uh, some something like twelve years. Uh, and it's been really a wonderful run. So I didn't get bored at UC Davis. You didn't get kicked out. Um, no, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, yeah, tell me about your research at UC Davis. Well, sure. Well, um, I mean, it was at UC Davis um, that uh, I managed to do the pigeon work. Yeah, I want to hear about, like, how did you come up with training well, pigeons? It was, it was easy. I'm driving to work. And there's somebody on the radio who's describing uh, a UC Davis researcher who was, who was talking about his work on pigeons and, and visual recall. Pattern recall. Uh -huh. yeah, visual recall. Can they recognize, you know, sort of... How, and how you heard this on the radio. Yeah, I heard it on the radio. And I thought, wait a second, visual recall, that's what pathologists do. And uh, so I called up this guy and said, hey, do you think it would be a good idea to... Um, uh, look at borrow a few pigeons. What the pigeons can do what pathologists do, and he said that's a great idea. But don't talk to me. You have to talk to Ed Wasserman, 
who's the guy in Iowa who actually is the, the major player in, 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 uh, in this field and, and all the pigeons. Um, and he thought it was a great idea. And then we, we just did the research. So who like you, you build this cage for the pigeons? No, 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 that's his stuff. So he, he, oh, he, so he already has for training pigeons for yes, and like researching things. very sophisticated oh. investigations. Um, and in fact, um, he, he recently published a paper showing that pigeons and humans look at images the same way. In other words, what the components that, 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 that are important to humans are important to pigeons, which makes sense because pigeons are very visual creatures. If you think about the world they live in, they live entirely visually. They don't do things by touch. They don't do it by hearing. They don't do it by smell. They're out in the... So they have two tasks. Uh, one is to, you know, sort of find their foodstuffs, and the other is to avoid being eaten by camouflage snakes. Okay? Okay. Camouflage snakes. What do that's we mean by huge, that? I mean, literally, a snake can, can have colorations. Um, I have an image somewhere that look just like, for example, fallen leaves on the bottom of a forest floor. But we're talking floor. literally about snakes? Yes. I thought that yes, like not, I mean, falcons or birds of well, prey would... No, but I mean, a pigeon is, is wandering around on the ground. Oh, okay. And snakes like to eat birds. And they have to make sure that they don't wander into a snake. And the, I, the, have, I have never the, thought snakes are a threat for pigeons. Maybe because I come from Poland and we only have like two species of snakes. And maybe so, but maybe. yeah, I mean, I, I actually, I'm not making this up. I, I, I looked up sort of, you know, potential predators for pigeons in the, in, in the world. Uh, and the point is that, that snakes have, their job is to catch prey and they are extremely pigeons. sophisticated in their uh, camouflage. And if you look at a camouflage pigeon among, uh, sorry, a camouflage snake among, you know, lit, uh, you know, leaves on a forest floor, it's pretty much the same problem as telling the difference between, uh, you know, sort of normal and, and carcin, car, cancer uh, epithelial Malignant They're, epithelial you know, they look very, very similar or can be. So certainly to an unsophisticated person, you can't tell them apart. And so pigeons have the skills to tell, you know, tiny, tiny pattern differences apart. And that's what pathologists do. Oh my goodness. This is hilarious. <laughs> this is so cool. So you did pigeons at uh, UC Davis. Yeah. What about, I, uh... I didn't know what to do. One of the huge frightening things for me was to um, come to a place and they say, here's your, here's your office, here's your lab, here's your startup package. Good luck, Dr. Levinson. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Uh, since I had no clinical responsibilities, everything had to be research. Research. Uh, and I really didn't know what to do. The pigeons weren't a serious thing. They were just a... a hugely fun experiment that went, you know, went viral, but that's not something you can make a career out of. But I totally knew I was went viral. Yeah. Like can, if there is any uh, research paper in the pathology world that went viral, this is the one. And I was, I was just presenting at the conference at the ACP American College of Veterinary Pathologists annual meeting. And I had slides where I had like uh, snippets out of literature. And then I had uh, this like contrast literature versus real life. And my real life example was um, the number of followers that clinical pathologists using static pathology and veterinary medicine have. And like uh, one account had 29,000 followers, the other one 17,000, the other one, I don't know, 15,000. And I think that... Uh, this is more than all those other publications that I showed before and I showed like 10 publications ever had. Like, I don't think people read this stuff, but the pigeon thing, everybody in pathology world, they know about this. <laughs> Just lucky, I guess. There was a paper last year called, uh, the title of the, of the paper was Pathologists Are Not Pigeons. See? Like, yeah. There is a whole subculture of this. I know, exactly. I need to make a video on TikTok about it. And, you know, I was told, to just to get a little bit of sort of career story, I mean, people said, you're wasting your time. This is not going to help you. This is not serious. You know, so don't listen to people. Do what you want. Do what's fun. I totally, I totally signed this, uh, th this now, that's, sentence of wisdom. However, I do have to say that said from a perspective of late in life, full professor with tenure, right? Different, got different the position out of the yes. blue. So I, I, even, I even wrote a poem that says, I'm professor, I'm vice chair, I've got tenure and I don't care. And, you know, that's a, I, I have to admit, it's a very privileged situation to be in. So, but 
fortunately, I did manage to connect up with an old friend of mine who developed uh, some interesting technology using ultraviolet illumination for imaging. And what he was doing was in vivo imaging. And the trick there was UV at not just what sort of pathologists think of as UV, which is like 350, 380, you know, basically just below blue. This is sort of similar deep UV at 260 or 280 nanometers, uh, which is so UV-ish that it doesn't even go through glass. So you can't use a standard microscope lens. You have to use quartz. Or, okay. But what it does is it, it, it did an amazing thing. Because it's, you may know, light traverses tissue, the depth in which it goes is very, very dependent on the wavelength. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, red goes all the way through. You can see a red uh, laser pointer through your finger. You put it on one side and then you look at the other side and it glows. Mm -hmm. and, and if you want green or blue laser, you don't see anything because it, it all gets absorbed right away. And ultraviolet is even more so. It gets absorbed within 10 or 20 microns. Mm -hmm. So you okay. don't need, and here's the trick. That means you don't need to make a thin section slide to get thin section histology because this UV light goes in 10 microns, which is sort of like a thick slide. Mm -hmm. And then what? And then what's really cool about when it goes in is that it excites autofluorescence. And interesting enough, unlike sort of the fluorescence that we're used to when you look at a you know a fluorescein or a psi three or a Alexa this or that, but where the excitation let's say is at 680 and the emission is at 710, they're within 10 or 20 nanometers of each other. The, ex mm -hmm. the excitation at 280 actually generates fluorescence way out in the visible. So you can excite at 280 and you can still get red, green, or blue light coming back out, which means you can collect the light with a standard microscope lens and go and collect it with a color camera. So it is amazingly simple technology to do what we now, what the field calls slide-free pathology. You don't have yes. to make a slide and you get histology. And lots of people are doing this, uh, many, many different approaches. Uh, some of them are extremely compelling. However, often they use lasers, they use computers, they use optical uh, shaping devices to, to make uh, you know, structured illumination. They use uh, sound waves, all kinds of crazy things. And this just uses a, an LED, a UV LED, a regular microscope lens and a color camera. So it just, uh, and in fact, it's been implemented by a, a junior colleague of mine on a cell phone. So, I'm like staring into this yes. camera. I'm like, yes, I want to talk about it because when I was researching you, I'm like, okay, let's talk about this, this main thing, AI, but there's so many different things that you <laughs> did. And I'm like, we need to talk about this as well, because it, it is something that everybody thinks is like a uh, very far future, this glassless pathology. When is it going to be? And oh my goodness, and now you're saying it's on the cell phone. Tell me about it. I want to talk well, about it. Well, so we spun out a company from, from our lab. Mm -hmm. And by our, I just want to give full credit to my uh, uh, colleague, Farzad Feraduni, who started as a postdoc in my lab and is now uh, just coming up to be associate professor, which is mm -hmm. a nice evolution for, for him. Uh, and so he, he basically sort of built in, in all of these systems that I'm, I can talk about. And uh, so a company- What's the going, company name? Well, uh, it's now it, it, it also went through a few changes, but I think it's now called Smart Health Diagnostics. DX? Smart Health DX. Have you heard mm -hmm. of them? Yes, I have. Recently. Okay. So they, they took over this technology and they're moving ahead with it. But in the meantime, my colleague Prasad came up with a different approach, which uh, doesn't use UV at all. It uses just uh, blue light, but it generates images immediately that look just like H&E, a thin section. And that, uh, it's a terrible name, but I called it FIBI, Fluorescence Imitating Bright Field Imaging. So it's a very, not very, okay. so, not very uh, sophisticated name, FIBI. But I actually did it as a kind of rhyme because I had previously had a, a, a brief exposure to uh, another kind of multiplexed imaging using lanthanide label antibodies. I don't know what that is. Well, I mean, I know what antibodies are, but I don't know how, um, what's it's called. Uh, there are two two groups that are doing that, both companies. Uh, and you can look at between, you know, 40 or even 100 different antibodies simultaneously because this, the, the signals can be separated using mass spec. And so I worked on that and actually gave that one of those technologies a name, which was multiplexed ion beam imaging, which is MIBI. So then I did FIBI. I, think I've I done know MIBI. You know, I know maybe. maybe. Yes, oh, I know yeah. maybe. I didn't know what it stood for. I so, know maybe. So I named maybe maybe. 
And um, uh, like actually, the other thing I like about MIBI is that I get to say how it works. It's you 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 scan the the tissue with an oxygen duoplasmatron. That's the is, the what? device that makes uh, oxygen ions that are strong enough to blow up these lanthanides and send them off into the mass spec. This gives me the chance to say oxygen duoplasmatron. It's a but I don't do word. that anymore. But anyway, MIBI became fitting. And we founded wow. another company called Histolics. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to get that up and running. Uh, actually, uh, a paper was published earlier this year, a validation study. We looked at 100 different cases and compared the FIBI images with standard H&E and got a 97% concordance with pathologists who had never been trained on FIBI. So the images evaluation to be just read directly by untrained or un unprimed pathologists. FIBI, the blue FIBI. light thing. FIBI, F-I-B-I. Okay, and what was the previous one? The the mute the well, that's called Muse. 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 Is, Muse. Um, what is it? Microscopy and Microsc UV, UV surface excitation. Exactly. And I called it Muse yeah. in honor of the co-inventor who was Stavros Dimos, who was from Greece. So Muse in Greece. Because the Muse is in, in Greece in my yeah. mythology. So okay, I see this. Like uh, words are important, and they language are. is important. Yeah. There is a theme there. Exactly. Okay, so Muse is now acquired by Smart, Smart, Smart Health. Health DX, mm -hmm. and then Phoebe. You're starting with Phoebe. Uh, you just finished the validation study, right? Okay. Is yeah. Muse being used for any like diagnostics at the moment? I don't know if it's being used, but it is um, certainly being. I think geared up to go through the FDA and get out there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And but I know the, that the company is going to be advertising on uh, to veterinary um, professionals and veterinarians as well. Yes, they have a couple of things going. And of course, we do with um, with Phoebe uh, because UC Davis has is home to the world's number one vet school, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, and so we've got some collaborations going with with uh, veterinarians and vet paths people. Uh, so interesting. And there's some technical advantages uh, to Phoebe. Uh, for one thing, the images look like H and E directly. Strangely enough, how do you make them like H and E? What do you? They just are that do? way. So how does how does Phoebe... like you just? But how they are that way? Okay. Uh, do you stain it with something? Oh, I'm sorry. The the the, the, you know, the 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 thick specimens, which can be fresh or fixed or frozen, mm -hmm. but just not. They don't have to go into paraffin. They don't have to be thin mm -hmm. cut. Uh, so you can okay. just take a piece of tissue right right out of the... Uh, it's a surface, like surface imaging, It's surface. Right? And then we mm -hmm. stain for 20 seconds with hematoxin and 20 seconds with ESA. And oh, then that yes. sounds familiar. It's yeah, H&E. That's it. image that's, is differently. That's right. And then the magic is, it's bizarre. Uh, so, we, and we excite with 405 nanometer blue light from an LED. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you think... So, well, a step back. How do you make Muse images to look like H&E? Uh, you have to, you, uh, they're fluorescent. So, and the you colors have to translate are into, for you, it's, it's easy. You can, you can invert them. You can, uh, okay. So sense. you basically That's... like translate the colors into different it's, colors. Exactly. So you map invert... the colors into different colors. Right. Whereas your can look, colors... They can look uh -huh. very, very H&E like. And a lot of the other techniques, you know, generate two grayscale images and they just take one image and make it blue and the other image and make it pink and squish them together and it looks like H&E. The advantage to Muse and to Phoebe over some of the other techniques or hand advantage is that it uses a color camera, which means that you get lots of colors, not just a blue channel and a red channel. And mm -hmm. as you know, pathology has more, there's more to life than red and blue. There is. Green, and, for example. Uh, this reveals things about the tissue you don't see of other things. Amazing. So, okay, Phoebe, is mm -hmm. H and E without glass, right? With a normal microscope camera with a microscope lens. Yeah. And um, what about? Well, I love and the blue and about. a blue light excitation. And so why does it look like bright, why does it look like bright field? Yeah. Why? Because the the excitation light, the the four hundred five nanometer excitation light, goes into the tissue past the surface and down into the bulk tissue. Because don't forget, these are thick slices. By thick, I mean. 100 microns and, and on a, you know, a tenth of a millimeter. So not thick in any real sense, but thick certainly in terms versus a, a thin slide. But we typically look at one or two millimeter, three millimeter sections that you can easily generate just with a razor blade. What happens is the blue light goes into the tissue and creates tissue autofluorescence, which just becomes this sort of 
cloud of whitish light in the tissue, half of which comes back to through the surface, through the lens, into the camera. And when it goes through the surface, it gets absorbed by the hematoxylin and eosin stains, which is exactly what happens on your regular microscope, right? But from the other side, from... from well, no, the, I mean... Like this the, one goes from the inside and illuminates and in a... No, it's the same, same idea. I it's mean, the same. basically your, your microscope light is from below the surface. Mm -hmm. And FIPI, the autofluorescence is generated below the surface. And then it comes back up. Okay, yeah. It's like a microscope light underneath exactly. the surface that you're trying to image. Exactly. Oh my goodness. So, Richard, where, like, is this now, are we going to get rid of glass within the next year? Like, where do you see it coming? And what are the disadvantages of this? Like, why is it not yet everywhere? Well, uh, I blame Maybe because myself. you patented it and you don't want to Yeah, yeah, it. I know. Anyway. It's, um, first of all, Muse came to life uh, in a happier investment time. As you know, some investments these days are much harder to come by people at the People don't just mm -hmm. throw tens of millions of dollars at you uh, the way they used to. So it's been a little That's bit harder bad. in the fundraising world. Uh -huh. And secondly, I think it's, it's a matter of, of uh, getting the work done, getting the word out, and, and then demonstrating it as not just as pretty pictures, but actually functionally useful. And okay. the utility of this kind of work, and we will get to AI in a second, mm -hmm. uh, is that you can, get you can speed things up. So intraoperative, you can get rid of frozen. This is like basically you're taking pathology to where radiology is, where you don't need the analog part of it. Exactly. And, and so it goes right to digital, direct to digital from the, from the tissue. You, no, no slide, no film, right? Same thing. You basically radiologize pathology with this. Right. And in fact, we can interact with radiology because a lot of interventional radiology sort of culminates in a needle biopsy. And then they don't know what's in the biopsy, right? So we and can then, then you just phoebe it. And you see exactly right then and there, and you know if you, if you hit the tumor, whether you have adequate tumor for your molecular, and maybe even do a definitive diagnosis just on all at once. Oh my goodness, people who are watching this on YouTube are going to see me like with very wide <laughs> eyes. Yes, this is amazing. So let's how how many how much more time do you think till it hits the market? Uh, if only, if only, um, you know. Like in the best case scenario and in the worst case scenario. Well, but the worst case scenario, scenario it is that uh, something will certainly hit the market. I mean, slide-free mm -hmm. microscopy, there are five or six or seven people with different technologies all mm -hmm. vying to do this. It will happen. Mm -hmm. uh, who's going to win? It's really an execution See. story. Who, you know, they, mm -hmm. you know, VHS beat Apple Betamax, right? Or it was better execution, poorer technology, but they won. So we'll see. Uh, but I would say within three years, it will be in frozen section rooms, which is pretty. Okay. And well, before that, it'll be in, in researchers' hands. Uh, and depending on what the FDA does, it could be a um, LDT, right? If you just validate mm -hmm. it in house, you don't. Mm -hmm. We don't have to wait for the whole FDA approval story. You validate it in house, and then you can use it internally. And then uh, veterinary, you know, you bring in a racehorse from, you know, 50 miles away. That's not easy. And then you do a biopsy and then you send the horse away and they have to come back a week later because For another you... biopsy. Yeah. So now you can do it all with the horses there. Amazing. Oh, my goodness. Ha. And you also touch on that on something that is like not so obvious because a person can come back for whatever procedure immediately. They usually go to, a, well, they, they travel as well, but horses are difficult to transport. Yes. Amazing. And what's really, really cool is the, the NIH seems to like what we're doing and we've received That's a, good uh, sign. A, a bunch of major grants recently. One um, just worked through all of the paperwork. This has been funded to develop FIBI for core needle biopsy of breast cancer and uh, develop and a test in the country of Ghana in Africa. Oh my goodness. Five years award. Why Ghana out of all the countries in the world? A good question. Uh, well, I had reached out to a colleague of mine at ASCP, Dan Milner. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you come across him. No, no. Um, and he's been very active in, in global health stuff. And I said, you know, I've got this really cool technology. Where should we go? And he said, I have this great person in Ghana. Beatrice connections is she, everything. So just lucky. She's the CEO of, and uh, she's a breast cancer surgeon and founder and CEO of a hospital in Ghana and a very prominent person with uh, uh, lots of 
you know, all of the right tools influence and this way. Mm -hmm. um, and then I I want to also know the part uh, with the smartphone. Oh uh, well, that's that hasn't been pursued. It was it was uh, so my colleague uh, Yihi Liu at uh, Cleveland Case Western Reserve basically just figured out how to how to hook up a little LED. Uh, a U, this was a UV LED next, and on an Apple phone and a nice microscope lens, which is basically the same lens that's in the phone. You just flip it, uh, invert it, and it becomes a microsc microscopy system. And he was able to power and then use the, 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 of course, the camera in the phone. And he was able to power everything uh, with the iPhone battery. So there were no cables at all. And you could do really wonderful histology just by touching the phone to the surface of, of uh, the tissue. And it was published. I need to find this publication. I think I'm on it somewhere. So if you look up me and yeah, news. Yeah, I'm going to Google Scholar you and uh, yeah. find it. <laughs> but it, it, the images are gorgeous. And it's from a cell phone. with And the extra costs to, to turn a cell phone into a microscope was like under $100. Wow. It's just like... Uh, rebuilding the smartphone or having like an attachment just a, a, a little actually very thin i mean this he did a great job it's just a, a machine a plastic machine part that just fits over where the camera and the lens are right now uh mm -hmm. it's about i don't know two or three millimeters thick and mm -hmm. and it's freestanding in other words it, it plugs into the phone somehow but it doesn't need any other wires uh, and is it and being used anyway i don't think so it's being wow. used to yeah, I mean, it's it's. I have no idea why it's not being used. Um, okay, but I will I will investigate yeah, it that topic. I mean, it absolutely should be. And the same thing you, we can do with Phoebe. We haven't done it. It would be a gorgeous grant. It would be wonderful for school kids, right? Imagine having this and being able to do microscopy at, in the fifth grade. Imagine how that would open up people's eyes. Yeah, but also like everywhere. Everywhere, exactly. You're out in the forest. Yeah. I mean, you can do it anywhere. Amazing. Maybe can I buy it? <laughs> We can take this offline and we can see if, if it can be revived. But somebody needs. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna find the paper. Um, yeah, check this out. Okay. But okay, so glassless pathology, <laughs> pathology that actually is now on par with radiology regarding the technology. Mm -hmm. We don't have we. Basically, I have the potential to very soon eliminate the complaint, oh, it's analog, uh, and then you have to add digital pathology and AI on top of it, and it's overhead, and it's everything, because we still do analog. Now, there is yeah. potential not to do analog. It's direct to digital. Direct to digital, so exactly like radiology. So this is where your encounter with AI uh, happened, or tell me your story with AI and your relationship with AI and pathology. My career is very, very strange. I've had one graduate student in my, in my entire life. And as, a full, just, as a full professor. As, as a full professor as well. I mean, don't forget, I was sort of 10 years, 13 years in industry, right? Or 15 years in industry. I was, and I was just an autopsy pathologist way back when, uh, you know, so I didn't really have any standing to have a graduate student, but I joined the biomedical engineering graduate group when I was at Davis and, and a, a mm -hmm. student reached out to me to join my lab and do his PhD with me, which was remarkable. And he actually did it. We was four years through, through the COVID thing. I never saw him. He just all, he did all his work from home and he was doing AI. PhD from home. I love it. That's, yeah, that's great. And he got his PhD just now. Uh, he's nationally or internationally famous. Why? He got his PhD at the age of 19. I think I saw a news, something news, press release or something about it. How, really? how, how, <laughs> tell me how, like, so 19, he started at 15. You're not even done with high school at 15. I know, I know. Tell me with a story. He, he's way outclassed his sister who is doing a mass, not a PhD, but just right now with just a master's degree and she's already 17. Oh no, that's like <laughs> a failure, a failure. Oh, in voice. This is in like mind-blowing, right? Oh, she, at 17, you know, she's, she's, she's an absolutely uh, professional-level singer. And in fact, during the graduation ceremonies for all of the graduate students, at which my student got his, received his PhD, she was the one who sang the national anthem for this whole Oh, thing. my goodness. <laughs> this is like some movie story. Exactly. We're still working <laughs> together. We just had a paper accepted in Optica. Okay. There is a good uh, many good collaborations between the um, the optics and like the light vision scientists and pathology is the super cool intersection. Actually, the first company I worked uh, for uh, where I encountered digital pathology, one of the founders had the Nobel Prize in I would have to Google what 
exactly in, but it was something with microscopes and optics. Let me Google him. So he and I were working with another imaging technology. This is stain-free imaging. Mm -hmm. uh, stain-free. So not only glass-free, now it's stain-free. Stain, this is glass-free and stain-free and mm -hmm. super resolution, but it's grayscale. So my, I didn't say what my, my uh, graduate student did. He was working on uh, AI tools to convert one image into another image type. And so he was taking the news images and the FIBI images and making them look identical to H and A. And then we did the same thing for this other technology, which is called, it's another phrase I love, quanti QOBM, quantitative oblique back illumination microscopy, mm -hmm. which sounds frightening, but it's, it, it does. fits in with it's, my It sounds general. like this other word that you like to use, uh, oh, the oxygen, yeah, oxygen something. Dual plasma, but the oxygen, oxygen dual plasmatron, Thing. That's a five hundred thousand dollar million dollar box. This uh -huh. is another one that fits into my my theme of appropriate technology. It also requires just a couple of LEDs, a microscope, lens, and a camera. That's all, and it does okay. high resolution, super fast imaging of unstained tissue. And this is not only just the surface, but also a little bit uh, depth resolve. Really fast, really cheap. And uh, then what my graduate student and I did with this other group. I didn't develop the technology at all, but we developed the AI tools to convert these grayscale images into things that look just like H and A. And so that was what was published. So and the, what are you going to do with all those different microscopy technologies? Is there going to be one that's going to win it? No, or... I think they're all, they're all good for different things. So this mm -hmm. QOBM thing, I don't like FIBI for in vivo because it involves okay. a stain. This is stain okay, true. It could be mm -hmm. handheld. And one of the first potential uses is, for example, looking at brain tumor, intraoperative brain margins. Uh, and so that's what part of the paper was. We showed that you could tell the difference between non-normal brain using QOBM this is and converted to h &E. So yeah. this was your first encounter with AI? No, or Like hands-on encounter? I go way back. Um, tell because... me about your history and your relationship with AI in pathology. I want to know about. Well, back to this company that I work for, Cambridge Research and Instrumentation. Mm -hmm. We developed this multispectral imaging. And then uh, one of the people who um, I'm still pals with developed uh, neural net tools mm -hmm. for segmenting pathology images. So it wasn't deep convolutional neural nets, but it was like a three layer neural net. And this is back in the early 2000, mid 2000s, right? Mm -hmm. And it it developed into a software called Inform, which remarkably yes, that's a Koya. It's at a Koya. It's still being still being it's sold. Being and used actually, where I, I am. So this is way back when. And actually, I have a couple of patents related to that. None of which got me any money. All, all of it went to the company, unfortunately. But so I I think I'm one of the pioneers in AI tools for pathology. Amazingly enough, you know, just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Fantastic. Okay, so that was what which year. I don't know, mid 2000s. And actually, I, I really like it. It's very low overhead, very fast. It's trained by example, much faster than convolutional neural nets, at least to sort of work through needs less yeah, training. If it only has like three layers, that's yeah, a boom, lot boom, less boom. than the CNN. It's not necessarily as robust, but if you have a simple problem or like given a, 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 a single image and you just want to find all the nuclei in that image, you don't need hundreds and hundreds of examples you, because, you know, it's mm -hmm. very defined problem set. I managed to find uh, what Gerbening got his Nobel Prize in. It was 1986, and it was the scanning tunneling, tunneling microscope. Scanning oh. tunneling microscope. And he shared it with Ernst Ruska because Ernst uh, won the other half of the prize. So Gert actually won half of the prize. I didn't know you could win half of a Nobel Prize. Well, you know, I think you can only have, you can have a group, but I think you can only split it among three. Amazing. Okay, so now let's go to the paper, AI and Pathology, What Can Possibly Go Wrong? And I'm going to start sharing this here again, because there's, there are some visuals in the papers that we want to address. But it was recent. This was published in uh, 2023, which is this year, right? Which is recent. <laughs> Very recent. But yeah, tell me, why did you decide to write well, this Well, actually... Paper? Uh... Kay Nakagawa and I have, have been talking about writing a paper like this for years, five years now. And it, mm -hmm. it kept saying, 
I blame it all on him because I, I really get a chance to blame somebody else. He he said I'm I'm busy. But He's I'm also the first it. author of the paper, it, and you're exactly. The last, so. I'll get to it this week, and then of course this week went by, and then this month went by, and then it just never happened. But we had we had like a page or two written, you know, five years ago. I honestly don't know how this happened, but I think he and I talked again about sort of resurrecting it in the in the modern era where it would suddenly have, resonate with a lot of people. Uh, and oh um, now it's like the topic of every AI discussion, like with large language models. I don't know if you guys addressed already large language models here. Uh, yes, think, of course, because you generated uh, a poem with a large language. <laughs> yes. In fact, uh, the first two paragraphs of the first two paragraphs of the paper were written by Chat GPT, and the final poem was written. Yeah. By do Chat you want to read the poem, Richard? Do you want to okay, read we the can poem? Do that. And again, I, I want to I want to claim. I think uh, priority, and I don't know how many pathology journal articles have poems in them. I have not read any other one with poems. I know, so I I think I'm pioneering oh, a whole other genre. I think we should have uh, you know limericks and things. I don't know how many enthusiasts you will find for that. Maybe <laughs> all those with similar background to yours, with the English major English literature yeah. background. <laughs> Yes. Well, shall I read the uh, shall I read the poem that's on yeah, the screen? Yeah, go, go ahead and read the poem. Okay, so um, I asked ChatGPT. Basically, I just gave it the title of the paper and said, "Please write a poem uh, in the style of Edgar Allan Poe." For whatever reason. Um, yeah. And... What what reason? Why did you? No, no, this is very just, um... random thing. You couldn't think of a. You know, I don't like Emily Dickinson as much as other people do, but. Okay. Um, so I just said that, and uh, it it really came up with this right away. It wasn't as if it generated you know four hundred and I had to pick the best. This was the one it came up with, and I just we'll go with this. And that's the the amazing power. And which and uh, which power. chat did you use? The three point five or the oh, four? Um, I don't remember all of the details. Uh, and there were some issues about setting some settings to. Uh, I forget. I mean, I have the I have it written down, um, but That's basically good. you probably can probably in the materials and methods of this paper. <laughs> it so should it be, be because so now it. you're required to say like what you did with ChatGPT and how much exactly. and which model and everything. Yeah, no, all that stuff. Uh, I forget. There were some 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 knobs you could tweak, and I forget everything about mm -hmm. how that how they were tweaked. Um, but it was very straightforward. You know, I'm not an expert in large language models. I just uh, was a user. But anyway, so this was a whole paper on, on uh, well, all of the dangers of AI that might be discovered in uh, as it gets developed for uh, pathology. And they are substantial. And people, you know, this is by now well discussed and to some degree well understood. Um, so anyway, I asked a, uh, the chat GPT what it thought about this whole thing and to write a poem about it. And so this is what it it says on, on the screen, it's, it's up there, but I'll read it in case you're just listening mm -hmm. to it. Yes, yes. It says, the machines, they may seem infallible, but their errors, they can be terrible. A missed cancer, a false positive too, the consequences dire and askew, but yet we still march on with this quest for faster results with little rest, but let us not forget the human touch, for in the end, it is what matters much. So let's tread with caution and care as we delve deeper into this AI affair where the stakes are high and the risks real. In the field of pathology, let us not seal our fate with machines, but with our own eyes and judgment and expertise that never dies. Oh my goodness, this is deep. Wrote by Chad GPT. I know. But so no, it's, it uh, totally captures, captures the spirit because, you know, these are powerful tools and both on the imaging side and on the large language model side. And now there is a combination like on, on the, I don't know, popular side, there is this chat GPT vision where you can interact with images. You can generate image, uh, which we're going to be talking about one generated image in this paper as well, um, by generative networks. But you can also have an image and have um, the language model extract the content of the image and describe it. And there have been attempts uh, already to do it with pathology images. And the results weren't like crazy off, yeah. I would say. And it's sort of an oxymoron to have chat GPT tell us about the risks of chat GPT, but do it in such mm -hmm. a beautiful manner, right? <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, 
this has not been available. I I would not have imagined it. like that you will have a tool that you can tell them what you want to have on the presentation uh, on the PowerPoint presentation. It's going to make you this slide, and this is basically uh, maybe not entirely, but I did it for the last conference I was presenting it. It's like mind blowing. It is. But getting back to the dangerous, let's talk about the image in the in okay, the paper. Okay, so let's which go to the actually, first. Well, let's go to the first image. Yeah, the first. Yes, let's go to the first and the second. Actually, the second image, um, and everybody who's watching this on YouTube uh, can look at it on YouTube. We are screen sharing it right now, and I'm gonna also link to all those papers, um, to both of the papers in the show notes. But yeah, figure one. I'm gonna read the description. Image generated by Dali Mini based on a prompt pathologist confronted by AI. Richard, can you tell me about this artwork? It just did it. <laughs> I mean, literally, that's what popped up. And I haven't seen a better visual representation of exactly the topic that we're, that we're discussing. Uh, there's a pathologist, clearly identifiable. And then some AI, one sort of humanoid, the other not, but with a glowing red thing in its supposed brain. And it's just a very gentle way of capturing this whole storyline uh, where, and there, you know, it is a confrontation, but it's not, you know. It's not aggressive confrontation. No, no, it's just kind of what's going to happen next, guys, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's the style of uh, like the brains representing AI or like brains slash neural networks. Uh, right, of exactly. Representation of AI. But I do like just stylistically, and again, this is amazing, that, that sort of orange, uh, you know, glowing disc, which is thrown in there by the artist, <laughs> Dali Midi, and it, mm -hmm. you know, just dramatically improves the content of the, of the image from a style point of view. Interesting. So let's go to the second image. The second image okay. actually um, references the pigeon paper. It, it did indeed. Right. Let me Dali read the Mini. description. Image um, generated by Dali Mini based on the prompt pathologist training pigeons style of Rubens. Looks promising, except for one thing, Richard. Tell us what this yes. one thing is. That this I didn't ask for it. So yeah, pathologist pigeons, perfect. I'm happy. AI is going to rule the world. Um, but then if you look down at the bottom right, there is a strange creature that uh it's impossible really to describe. It looks sort of like a combination of cat and rabbit bat with who knows how many. It has legs. like eye-like structures on tentacles. I know. Who knows like what it is? Road I didn't face ask. Or... But I mean, if you look at the prompt, I didn't ask for it, throw in something horrible. I just said pathologist no. training pigeons. And it put Maybe that Maybe it was there. supposed to be a pigeon that, that didn't work out. But the I other pigeons are so realistic. They're Obviously, right. it's kind of well known that AI has problems with, with um, details. Like the fingers always look a little bit dysmorphic. The uh, the pathologist has, I assume, uh, these are glasses, but they're a little bit like <laughs> well, thick, like. The I mean, the things of have a jar. It's not fair. This is you know a year and a half ago. Um, That's true. By by a a sort of minor player in the field. Nowadays, the generative art is just astonishingly good. Um, that is true. And it would not have that little funny thing at the bottom right, that just wouldn't be there. Um, and it also has these these colors like a. Little color scale. Is this? I don't know about the colors, this? but he's he's wearing a nice, dirty white coat. <laughs> it, it is. It is because of the style of Rubens, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, those images represent what can go wrong, and I love what you have in this paper as well. It's a table, basically, of what all can go wrong. One of my co-authors is one of the leading AI scientists in the world, Faisal Mahmoud, and. Uh, uh, he came up with, with a nice with a list like this. It's a great guiding table, I would say, because you mm -hmm. have a, you have a, a column with challenges. You have the column of impact of AI and mitigation strategies, which is basically what's needed. Because I don't think there is a way to avoid it. And at some point, at the moment where it's mature enough and it's going to give us enough advantage in providing care. It's going to be unethical to not use it, but right. it doesn't mean that the, with the maturation of this technology, the dangers are going to disappear. And, and I think like there is no way to have 
two camps. Oh, one of those who are using it and the other ones who are not using it are, are against it because it can make so many mistakes. It's going to be, it's going to, it is going in the direction of, okay, what are the mitigation strategies? What risk assessment uh, points can we have along the process? And how can we, like, when can we say we did the best job we could have done? Well, I th again, I, I hate to say this, no. but read the paper. Um, there's some serious issues down the road, which has to do with the, the finances of, of these AI tools. They're very expensive to develop. And the question is, you know, how do you, do you lock them down and not improve them? If you improve them and spend another $10 million on a bigger data set, who pays for that? The company and how do you charge for it? And et cetera, et cetera. So there, there are, you know, just getting beyond kind of the theoretical questions of... of so are you getting into the like reimbursement um, side of, of uh, healthcare? Well, there's that, um, you know, and, and the challenge here is that the problem is that pathologists are always, already doing, quote, the gold standard level of care. So how do you add costs to, do, to generate just at best gold standard of care? Well, if you take away the glass... Then you kind of took well, away. Yes, now we're, the... now, now we're talking. Um, then it kind of like offsets the cost of developing everything on top of analog. But you know what? This is a question. Basically, uh, how do we implement digital pathology, regardless of AI? Because mm -hmm. and people already implemented. There is no. There are codes. There is no reimbursement yet. And. I say it's better. I mean, it's better for me to do my job as a veterinary yeah, pathologist. No, I, I'm, you know, it's. It's a problem. I mean, <clears throat> things that are objectively better still have trouble making it in the market. And uh, and you have some, you know, and, and then you have downstream issues like where do you store all these digital images? How do you pay for the storage? How do you, what, when do you get rid of them? You know, it's sort of, it, it, it kind of rhymes with the problem of, of electric vehicles, you know, perfect. That True. Tesla works very great. Parallel, very parallel. Yeah. Parallel and there's so many the infrastructure issues and downstream repair issues, and all kinds of things that really stand in the way. And you can't be naive about them. That is a very good point. And they want to emphasize this. You can't be naive. And like pathologists as a profession, they kind of like see beyond the marketing message, marketing messaging, messaging of any tool. But I would want to emphasize like we cannot be naive because obviously everybody is going to like of who's going to be offering this and it's the same with electric vehicles like narrative is they're better for the environment like in which aspects are they better what are the other aspects and it's like for any technology it's not you know uh, it's for any technology i what i'm seeing is okay if there is enough noise generated that takes the narrative in a certain way we tend to go with it but basically um Let's put it that way. It's human nature to like want to trust something. And if there is enough messaging around something, then at some point you assume, okay, and uh, this is what it is. I start believing it, right? In healthcare, we cannot allow for this to happen, regardless like how much messaging about anything there is. And I think we are in a kind of better position to not be naive about it, but I think we still need to pay extra attention, especially with tools that are like so much better than anything else. Like up to now, everything was like incremental. You could compare it to what was uh, immediately before. And now with generative AI and with the glassless imaging, it's it's like leaps forward. And that that's my like point. Okay, if it's so much better, is it then ethical not to use it? But is it ethical to use it if there are dangers? So let's talk about that a little bit. And well, I don't well, think there is a good talk, answer. Talk about boring AI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's talk the about boring, boring AI. AI. Is, um, it's things like, can you count the nuclei? Can you image analysis? Yeah, like the classical applications yeah. that we had with the uh, you, you know scoring you of things. Of, can you do quality control on your slides? Can you uh, prioritize the the your workflow? Can you order stains automatically. Can you do all of these workflow issues? And I don't think anybody, as long as this sort of the, the pricing was right and it helped with productivity, I don't think anyone could have a problem with that. See, I wouldn't have a problem with that 
most of the people wouldn't. Where is it? Why is it not implemented everywhere? That's the like it, it, boring and low risk AI. Well, it does still require an infrastructure. In other words, That's true. you need to be, a, yeah, you yeah, need yeah. To be a, a digital shop. Okay. Uh, right. And, but I would uh, argue again, I don't think it's even in every digital shop. Let's let's be optimistic and say 10% is digital, which I'm just taking out of my head. I don't think it's 10%, but let's say 10% is, uh, I don't think even 10% of this 10% will have those things implemented at the moment. Well, and then there's just to go down that road, uh, there's a, a sort of nice little tributary to all this, which is basically on your microscope digital. So you just have a camera that's sitting up there and you're moving the slide around and it's doing everything you want it to do, right? It's, it's looking at the images, it's, it's counting mitoses, it's stitching together a large field of view for you automatically. You don't have to think about it. You don't change anything about what you do and you don't have to buy a $200,000 scanner. You don't even need that to buy was, it. You know what my talk was at the ACP conference, one yeah. of the talks? Static telepathology, a thing of the past or a new trend on the rise. Yeah. So, you know, there are lots of flavors to this, and I'm not sure what's, what's going to win. Yeah. I, I don't think we can answer this question. Maybe we should meet next year and, like, have a follow-up conversation. <laughs> and that's the thing, you know, you have, there's fear. There are the enthusiasts who cannot be naive and are not naive. So they kind of like uh, want to promote, but all the concerns are legitimate. So yeah, I guess time will tell. And when there's going to be enough proof that's going to tell the science, the applications, I guess we will just see which way the world goes with this. Let me, let me hit two AI dangers. Mm-hmm. One is uh, bad training sets. And I think a, a sort of classic example of that is That's breast cancer. I don't, I forget which class, but um, there seems to be a different biology of breast cancer for West Africa than for the rest of the world. And the AI so tools much. that are trained in Pittsburgh don't work in, let's say, Ghana. And, you know, how do you monitor that? How do you document that? How do you fix that? This is... Yeah, how do you do it? You, you, you provide the different data sets, right? How do you pay for but, it? Yeah, how do you pay for it? That's always like, because there are so many fantastic initiatives and all the questions that they ask, like, where is it? Where is the smartphone microscopy? Where is the low-hanging fruits? Like, probably nobody backed it up with enough money to implement it, right? So that there is the answer to my question. But this is also super interesting. This is so recent because I just came from this conference and a colleague of mine, she works uh, for a large pharmaceutical company and she was asking the same question in the context of diversity, right? And diversity, when you talk about it, it's, it's more like, let, let's say in the socioeconomic context, but on context and, and like to be fair and just, but it totally translates into the scientific context and the functionality of the tools. Like uh, another example. So I was preparing uh, something for another webinar and I gave the prompt to Dali, a pathologist at the microscope out of uh, four images, obviously, not obviously, but obviously, sadly, obviously, four of them were white male, right? So yeah, it's all the biases that we have are being translated into the AI development sets, the thing is, okay, some of the biases we know about and many we don't know. I think biologically or like, yeah, biologically and through our experience, we are biased creatures. And to like undo this bias, we have to be conscious that we are biased creatures and mm -hmm. just like find the biases. Can you find all the biases? No, right? They're smarter at generating biases than we are in finding them. Famous classic case of, of uh, some imaging challenge, and uh, they looked at a bunch of patients from different hospitals, and it turns out that the patient's rooms in one hospital had a blue stripe behind the patient, mm -hmm. and but it was also a different pa pa patient population, and so the AI immediately clued into the blue stripe, and that was their differenti differentiating yes. uh, thing. Very much, yeah. The, the, there was another story like that, like with a red dot on a malignant or, or something. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's... A, another one that I heard from Anand Madabushi, who was a guest on, a, on my podcast, he was differentiating uh, wolves from husky, and it was fantastic performance, and it turned out there was snow behind the huskies always. Mm -hmm. It leaves us with no answer. Yeah, so, so what, like, if you were 
to express your opinion on AI. Yeah. What's your opinion? I mean, it's part of your res research. Uh, on the other hand, you are the author of the paper, What Can Go Wrong? Um, we kind of get to dead ends in our uh, in the whole discussion and in parts of the discussion we like reach th there are no answers to the questions do you have like an opinion well Could you like if you wanted to to give an opinion a short opinion on this and i'm going to give you my mind as we need to be informed of how these things work and then that's the best we can do at the moment. But I don't have anything deeper than that, unfortunately. Well, my analogy for AI and pathology based on something I just read <laughs> was um, automatic bartending robots and what this does to servers serving drinks in a bar. Uh -huh. And you think, oh, there are not enough servers and maybe none of the bartenders will just do this. And, and that means that, that they can sort of be more efficient uh, get the drinks faster to the, to the uh, customers, get higher tips? The answer is no, it's the opposite. Why? Sometimes that the customer wants a drink with, uh, you know, this bourbon or that bourbon or with or without the lemon or whatever it is, and the bartender robot can't do it. So this poor waitress or waiter uh, has to go running down to find a, a human bartender to go put the drink together. And he may be, he or she may be way overwhelmed. Meantime, the customer gets tired of waiting and leaves. So there goes a whole, the whole tip is, the whole tip is gone and she's, uh, and the, and the waiter has been running around like crazy trying to make it happen. And, uh, you know, so you get all these unintended consequences of something that works 90% of the time, but that fails miserably 10% of the time. What is that? What happens then? And I think the short answer is I have the faintest idea. We will, we will watch this space. I think is the best I can do at the moment. Yeah. Good one. Watch the space. And I mean. You have to watch uh, pretty closely at the high cadence as well, because there's going to be like every week, there's going to be some revolutionary new perspective or new paper on new technology. To me, it's like, okay, if something doesn't work at the moment, don't make it work. Wait for the next thing to come out. But yeah, a fantastic discussion. Thank you. It really was. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm wondering what uh, what the listeners are going to say about that, uh, <laughs> after this episode. And I love that it meandered like that. And, uh, and basically, like it takes it it takes us out of the, uh, the the simplistic binary nature of things. Like I don't know, this was something when I came to the U.S. It was like okay, it's pretty binary because there are only like two parties, and you either are for something or against. Like, I kind of noticed that it was more than in Europe, and I don't think uh, anything is binary. It will be fun to watch. It will be fun to watch. Thank you so much, Richard, for joining me. All right, thank and, you. And I hope you have a wonderful day. And you too as well. It was real pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for staying till the end. My favorite thing about this episode was understanding how close we are to glassless pathology. And I would love to understand this topic more. So I'm actually thinking of organizing a more in-depth series or a virtual event or a mini conference about it. So if you're interested in taking part in this, drop me a comment below writing glassless pathology. And I will know that you are interested and I'm going to start organizing this event. I'm looking forward to hearing from you in the comments and I talk to you in the next episode.